On this Tuesday, with some important agricultural data coming out, great to be chatting with the Executive Director of ABS, Dr Jared Greenville. How are you, Jared? Oh, very well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure, and in fact, uh, it's always good when there's good news from the agricultural sector. And whilst there's a few headwinds that we'll end up talking about, generally speaking, our crop expectations and indeed the commodities value is uh, all looking very healthy. Yeah, it's been a run of three really good years. Well, two good years and a forecast next year for, for a good good outcome as well. And so what we're expecting to see is the sector to remain above that $80 billion mark and to hit around the second highest ever sector value of $82 billion in the this coming, well, our current financial year, the 22-23 financial year. Now, that, does that represent, though, a slight downgrade on where we were in the last report a quarter ago? Yeah, it does. It's a, it's a slight downgrade from from what we saw last year, um, where we reached an all-time record of $85 billion. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, given you know we had some pretty exceptional conditions last year, um, and you know, just backing that back up again. And the seasonal outlook hasn't been as favourable, particularly in, say, Western Australia. But that's, a, again, a watch. There's a bit of an upside risk potential to that. Um, and so that's led to a slight you know, fall in overall value in the sector. Now, I noticed one of the graphs in this report indicates, if you like, there's sort of a little variation, which I guess you could really attribute to our export values uh, because of demand for our produce overseas as opposed to the production. So whilst production is at great levels, it does appear that there's this increased demand for our product that is really helping our farm gate value. Yeah, what we've seen come together last year and again this year is this high production but really high global prices. Um, and that's across the suite of products that we export. And when we look at it, I guess you'd say the, the bundle, the, the price bundle for all our export goods, it's really at 30 year plus highs. Um, and we're seeing that being driven by a few different things. I mean, at the moment, unfortunately, the, the events that are occurring in Ukraine have pushed grain prices up. Um, particularly wheat and, and canola, um, but also some adverse weather conditions that have occurred in other you know, producing regions have kept those prices high. Um, we're also seeing a maintenance of fairly high protein prices so across the meat products that we export. Um, and that was you know, a few years ago largely driven by African swine fever taking off in China, but prices have remained quite high albeit moderated, and we've at the same time now got some dividends from herd and flock rebuilding, which is starting to flow through to higher production. Now, all of that is good news, I guess, on the farm gate side in terms of what you're getting for our outputs, but the inputs are a challenge as well, and my eyes are drawn to a graph you've got in one of these documents here about um, the comparison between food and fertiliser costs. It does appear that, at least in around 08 or 09, we did have this disparity where fertiliser costs a lot more. What was going on then? Is there any similarity to what we're having in the market now? Yeah, we saw back in 07 08 the... Input prices, or particularly oil prices, went up sharply, and that triggered a whole range of different flow-on effects we saw in the, the global economy. Um, and we, we saw really what was termed back then the, the 7 or 8 food price crisis, where, where food prices jumped and, and so forth, and people were run out of you know ran out of food, or they you know really increased their levels of food insecurity. Um, and so we're seeing kind of similar effects here where, you know, input prices and, and fuel prices and fertiliser prices are really starting to jump back up. Um, at the moment, though, you know, we'll get some concern again over food security as we've seen play out, no doubt, in, 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 as a result of the Russian invasion as well. Um, but what we're seeing, I guess, on the, on the ground for Australian farmers is that fertiliser price is about three times higher than it was a couple of years ago. And so that will start to squeeze, you know, although we've got high, high prices for the products that we sell at the farm gate, we're also paying a lot more for imports. But to date, though, we've still managed to actually bring, you know, access the, the required levels of fertiliser. Yeah, and that's a, it's useful, I think, and farmers know from a long experience on the land generationally where these things go back in the past. And we are at a similar level to that 07-08 period. In fact, from your graph there, it indicates fertiliser prices were even higher back then. But you go back to the 70s and the food prices went up even at the pace that fertiliser was back then. Yeah, that's right. And so one, one of the things that's really kind of come back out of the global food system is been reforms that we've seen internationally in, in trade barriers really falling away in terms of food trade and agricultural trade. But it still is significantly distorted in the sense that there's more 
interventions in food markets and agriculture than we, we have in other markets. But that's really led to a global kind of shift in where food is produced. And so there's a number of regions which really increased production and that's helped, you know, as prices go up, we do get production responses, which mean that food prices don't go up as much as what we've seen in the past, say in the 70s. And, and if we take a longer back, a longer history to that as well. And so those kind of reforms that have helped, you know, it's it moderate some of the potential adverse effects of price spikes in one region or caused by one particular input. And in the end, I guess the human element to those sorts of reforms has been that I remember as a kid, you know, the pictures of kids in Africa that didn't have enough food. Is that one of the human benefits of having that sort of market that we have today? Yeah, most definitely. Um, those kind of, you know, those scenes that we used to see aren't as prevalent. I mean, there still is a significant share of the, the global population that do face food insecurity every day. But these definitely help. And, and there's also been a shift in the way that, countries respond to these crises um, and so we're seeing much greater levels of information sharing and then also countries stepping in by providing you know, aid to help these countries and be it financial aid or even food aid. So there's a number of processes that have been put in place globally to try and deal with these things in a much more proactive way. Now, whilst drought is still uh, clearly in our memories, it wasn't that long ago, the millennium drought, uh, we've got plenty of wet land at the moment. Is that a big factor for why, for say, New South Wales has been a general downgrade in terms of crop expectations, albeit still high in the 10-year averages? Yeah, that's right. So what's happened in the back of these continuing rain periods that we've had and the really wet end to what we saw last year is that some areas have just not been able to get in and put a crop in. Um, and that's affected parts of northern New South Wales and into Queensland in the Darling Downs region. And so we're seeing that the uh, area plant has started to fall away a little bit, which has started to drop some of the production numbers. Um, it also poses a bit of a risk as we close out the season. If it gets too wet, we've got that risk of quality downgrades in the crop um, that we saw last year. So there could be a price risk associated with that as well. Yeah, that's right. Whereas uh, from looking at your report, the crop report for September, Victoria and South Australia generally are on the same page in terms of what's planted in percentage terms compared to last year, albeit a few dry areas in the northern parts of SA. Yeah, that's right. So Victoria and South Australia haven't had that same excessive wet as we've seen in New South Wales, particularly in the cropping region. There, there has been certainly flood events all around the country. But they're looking at a much more balanced, I guess, production season, this one. Um, and we're expecting some pretty good numbers out of, of both those states in terms of their, their total area planted. And also some of the yields and, and production levels are looking pretty good. Now, just lastly, on winter crop, looking at South Australia as a bit of a case study, a big change in the amount of canola planted. We expected that. But uh, the productivity change is, is somewhat lower in your expectations compared, compared to, say, wheat. Yeah, that's right. So we, we're seeing, I guess, a, a bit of a fall away in terms of the, the yield and, and the like for, for canola in, in South Australia. And that's really just about the conditions that they're, they're facing. And we are seeing also a bit of a substitution towards wheat. Um, the, you know, I guess the economics of growing the two crops, and, and particularly away from barley into wheat, um, has really kind of you know, shaped up to be that being the most favourable crop at the moment to the South Australian growers. Is that somewhat uh, driven by, I guess, those input cost concerns? Canola, probably does it have a higher input cost element than, say, wheat? It's a bit of both. So it's a bit of the, the relative price differences we've got and the expectations of rainfall as it comes through um, and also the higher input costs that are associated with canola. Well, Dr. Jared Greenville from ABS, thanks for that comprehensive look through the reports that you've got out on Tuesday, the 6th of September. We appreciate your time with us today. Thanks very much for having me on.